A quick statement. I, I, I don't know that I would call this a disclaimer. I don't, I don't mean it that uh, it's a bad thing at all. More just information, okay? Um, when I plan out my sermon series, I don't always look at the date they're going to be preached on. And, um, and so this morning when I woke up and I started to go through my, I have a kind of a Sunday morning, early morning ritual of looking over my notes. And uh, I was like, oh, wow, today is Invite Sunday. This is, um, this is a weighty sermon for someone who has not been in church for a long time or maybe never been in church. And uh, at first, like, a little bit of anxiety started to creep in. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I think too often we, 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 don't, we don't respect the fact that people have brains and they can think. We don't respect the fact that they have the ability, you guys have the ability to come in and interact with this. And what I also want to say is this, at the heart of this sermon is the reason why we would paint something out there that says hope for everyone. Because if, if all hope for everyone is, is an inspiring message that makes you feel good for 12 hours, then I'm out. But if it really is something that is our living God moving and actively inviting into something that changes everything, then I'm all in. See, this message is interesting. I've been preaching for about 17 years, and I realized as I was going through my notes, because I'll often search my old messages, I realized I'd never preached a sermon on this man before. His name is Judas. If you don't know who that is, he is the guy that betrays Jesus. He's the guy that sells him out. He's the guy that looks at everything that is happening and goes, I, I, I can't be in on this. Like I, like, I can't be in on whatever this ultimately is going to be, so I'm going to actually take money. I'm going to profit off of turning him in. But there's something about Judas that, that messes with me. Yeah, I, I went to church for a long time, about almost three years before I would call myself a Christian. I would go and I would wrestle and wrestle and wrestle, and really in my brain what I was thinking was, is how can I come up with a reason to reject God? He obviously never gave me one. But I would ask these questions. If G Judas did this, why? Because what we don't talk about a lot is that for almost three years prior, Judas was doing some amazing things. Judas had been called and invited to follow Jesus the same way Peter and John and James and Thomas, the people who are kind of famous for following Jesus, had been called. There's actually a place in Scripture where Jesus sends the, the disciples out two by two, and, and they go out, and they heal people, and they preach, and people come to faith in God, and Judas is one of those people. And so my mind goes, what? What went wrong? How could you go from seeing some of the things that Judas saw to saying, I got to shut this down? We're in a series right now called God of the Cross where we've been looking at, at ways that, them, that this world, that our own flesh, that evil can invite us into roads that lead us far from God. Ultimately, the cross is the remedy. That's why we call it, name the series God of the Cross. But there are these things in every one of our lives, wounds, lies. And today we'll talk about vows that, that take us down roads that lead us directly away from God. See, what the Bible tells us is that Judas started to see things in Jesus that he loved. But then as Jesus started to live out those values in a way that wasn't congruent with how Judas thought it should go, he started to go, I don't think I can trust him. I don't think he's the one. See, Jesus challenges everyone. If you have a Jesus that doesn't challenge you, it's probably because you invented that Jesus. But Jesus challenges everyone. With his original disciples, a few of the ways that he challenged them was they had always believed, it was kind of universally understood, whether you were kind of a conservative religious Jew, whether you were a liberal religious Jew, even if you were just someone watching from the side, you understood that that Messiah was going to come and he was going to bring an army and he was going to put a hurting on whoever was oppressing them at the time. And Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't come with a sword. 
Jesus didn't come with, a, with, with an army that was going to wage war in, in, in the literal earthly sense and drive out who was ever occupying Israel. One of the ways Judas um, fought, like, believed God's kingdom would come is that the poor would be lifted up, that they would not be oppressed anymore. And Jesus said that. He said, man, the, the poor are going to be exalted in my kingdom. The hurting, the broken, the marginalized, they're going to have a seat at the table. They're going to be sons and daughters of God. And when Judas saw the way Jesus did that, he didn't like it. He was hurt. He was wounded. We're going to go through the scriptures. You don't have to take my word for it. And what we talked about a few weeks ago is when the wounds happen, which we've all been wounded, it's almost like fertile soil that gets tilled up. And then two things come at you, the truth of God or the lies of evil. And something's going to get planted there. And when the lies of evil get planted, then we start to live out of those things. We make what I'm going to call today vows. You might call it a mission statement for your life, like a mantra, something that you hold on to. So for Judas, he was wounded. Jesus was not the Messiah that he had pictured in his mind. Like the more time went on, the more he was like, this is not who that is, and he's wounded. And then the lies creep in. Truth too. The whole time Jesus is speaking truth to him, but the lies creep in. He can't be trusted. Maybe he's not the Messiah. Maybe your way is better, Judas. And as those lies are sown and take root... A vow is made so strong, a mission, a mantra so powerful that he's like, I will sell out God's son. It's intense. But I think of ways that I'm challenged with that. Have you ever been going down a road and thinking, man, God, this life is going great. And then, bam, something happens, right? You're like, Jesus, that is not what was supposed to happen, right? When we sing Jesus take the will, we mean drive me to the beach, <laughs> right? Like make this an awesome trip, not painful. We see pain, wounds happen. The fertile soil is opened up and things can get planted. And we can trust God at that moment. Even when he doesn't give us the answer we want, or maybe it seems like he gives us no answer, or we can go, I don't think I can trust him anymore. When we start to say, I can't trust him anymore, it's just going to be about me, a vow is made. And theologian, Pastor Marcus Warner says this, a vow, just so we can put a definition to it, is an attempt by my flesh, by me, to take control of a situation so that I don't have to trust God because he's unpredictable. C.S. Lewis always says he's not a tame lion. Like he's not someone you can just go, here's when you do this and here's how you do that. And he's like, I don't do that. And so we're like, it's way easier if I just hold tight myself. But look what happens when Judas tries to hold tight himself. It says six days before Passover, so a little over a week before Jesus is crucified. Just put that in your mind. I realize that um, many of you, maybe the Bible is not something you're familiar with. I'll try to walk us through that. Six days before Passover, so less than a, or a little over a week before Jesus is going to hang on the cross. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. This is a big deal. Because earlier in the story, Jesus had come to Bethany and performed his greatest public miracle. He had come to, to Bethany purposely late. He knew his friend Lazarus was sick. He knew his friend Lazarus was going to die. He waited to come. He came after he was dead because he's going to perform his greatest public miracle. He's going to really throw down. He tells his disciples, roll away the stone. Literally, the Bible says they go, don't do that. It's going to stink. Okay? 
I've read the Greek. The word for Greek and stink is our word for stink, okay? I mean, he's been dead for four days. Nobody wants that. They roll the stone away. In Bethany, people watching. Jesus has done this before in private. This time in public. He says, Lazarus, come out. Dude comes out. I can't imagine what that moment was like. I really can't. I don't know if I would have screamed and ran. I don't know if I would have fell to the ground and like, praise God. I don't know. That must have been unreal. But that happened in Bethany to Lazarus. So they're letting us know six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead, just to make sure you and I both know. By the way, if that was my tagline, I would put that on a business card. I'm Kyle, just so you know, the one Jesus rose from the dead. (laughs) Anyway, they're eating at dinner. There's this powerful story surrounding this, right? Like what that that miracle was about was was kind of proclaiming, this is what God is going to do. I'm going to be in the tomb. He's going to bring me out. So Lazarus, because man, if somebody raises you from the dead, when they come to your house, you serve them dinner. So they gave a dinner for Jesus there, okay? Martha was serving them. Martha is is Lazarus' sister. And Lazarus was one reclining at table with Jesus. So they're reclining, they're kicked back, they're just like reconnecting. Then Mary, the other sister of Lazarus, took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard extremely expensive. This figure I'm going to tell you in a minute is like an annual wage during the time. Anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So she is in complete worship. She goes to his feet, washes his feet in this perfume. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It's a powerful smell. You've probably been in that before. Like, I had these two sisters who were right under me. If my mom would leave for the day, they would go like, let's go play mom. And they would dress all up, and they would take her perfume, the one that my mom would do, like, in the walkthrough, you know? And they would go, so you could now locate them anywhere on the block, right? Like, you could always know where they were. My mom would come in after, did you guys use my perfume? I don't know what you're talking about, Right? But that's the power of this perfume. Everyone can smell it. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii? There's the the, the dollar amount, kind of the annual wage amount. Some say it's even more. And given to the poor. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. See, Judas at this point has already kind of given himself over to something other than Jesus. Like he started second-guessing him so much that that he's justifying stealing from him. He's now going to manipulate Jesus' words to kind of challenge him, like even try to put him in his place in front of others. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Here he tells Judas maybe the most challenging thing for all of the disciples. When the disciples follow Jesus, they give up everything. They walk away from their jobs. They walk away from the traditions. They they walk away and expose themselves to ridicule. And they follow this Jesus who they see do amazing things. But he keeps saying this one thing that they don't like, that none of them like. And they all keep going, I don't understand it. He keeps saying, I'm going to die. And they're like, that's not a good plan. But he tells them again, she is marking me for burial. And we'll see in a minute how this this exchange with Jesus, as far as scripture goes, sends him into that moment where he's willing to betray. Because what vows do when the wounds happen and the lies take root and you start to say, no, I'm going to live my life in a way where I don't trust God, where I only trust me, 
They insulate you from reality. And let me say this in a positive way at first. Sometimes when, when, when we're in a stage in our life, let's take God out of it for a minute, where we're in an unhealthy relationship. Someone's hurting us. Someone's neglecting us or abandoning us. And we go, I, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to let them have any influence on my life anymore. And we, we make a vow, like in a way that insulates us from them and we, we can move forward. There's, there's certain ways that our body kick into vows that sometimes make total sense. But with God, when they, when, they, when they keep us from him or a buffer from him, they have serious, painful ramifications. See, they insulated Judas from reality. The reality was he was bringing a kingdom that would elevate the marginalized and the lost and the hurting and the broken and the sinners, the weak. He just wasn't doing it in the way Judas wanted he was bringing in a kingdom that would cast out the oppressors. But he didn't give a rip about Rome. He cared about sin and evil. But Jesus didn't want to hear that. And vows don't let us hear that. And so Judas takes a step to do away with him. Do you have vows that keep you from hearing reality? To keep you from seeing who God really is. See, the cross is this amazing statement in a way that kind of shocks us out of our vows. That confronts us with just the real truth. That sometimes reality is painful. Sometimes it's brutally painful. But that God will save you from it. God can heal you from it. God can redeem you in it. God is with you in it. The cross saves you from reality. Vows try to insulate you from it, keep you from it, but the cross saves you from reality. It shows you how gnarly this world can be. I always say the cross is this amazing mirror that shows me what I've done, and it also shows me what's been done to me. And it says there's healing for all of it. That Jesus would suffer for every bit of it. For me, a vow that I believed young, that hurt. That hurt was when I was nine years old, my parents got divorced. And I, and I remember the day, I remember my dad coming in and saying, I'm not going to live here anymore. I remember the first time seeing my dad cry tears. I was a daddy's boy. I remember what it looked like to see my dad put a suitcase on his bed and take his clothes out and put them in the suitcase and know that it was not going to be that way anymore. And I remember looking at my mom and my brain going, she's the problem. She's the issue. And so for the rest of my growing up life, I didn't really want to be around my mom. I, I worked hard so that I could move and live with my dad. I would only, as far as the divorce decree goes, like to the letter of the day, go and agree to be with my mom. And I thought I was showing her. I thought I was teaching her. I made a vow, right, that I'm not going to rely on you and I'm going to let you know that I don't need you. Funny thing is, as you grow up, you tend to see things a little differently. You see that rarely ever in a conflict is just one person the problem. As I got older, I saw my dad's humanity. Nothing wrong, just his humanity. I went, okay, see some issues there, right? <laughs> saw my mom constantly moving towards me and me constantly going, not interested. Then I said yes to Jesus. God decided to begin to show me what my vow, the, 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 the commitment I had given to it, had brought out. When I had my son, Isaiah, and my mom came over, and she played with him on the floor, and day one day I just burst into tears, like, I don't do that. I was like, what's wrong with me? 
And I remember Joey going, I think you just want to have a connection with your mom. I was like, I don't like that. <laughs> I did, but I didn't want to believe, agree with that. See, vows can really mess with the truth that way. We can become so blinded to reality that we'll hold tight to anything, that we'll kind of fuel that vow to keep going. Think of what Judas had seen. Think of the miracles. Think of the personal invitation. Think of the resurrection. It's, it's not, guys, it's not a coincidence that this happens in Bethany where he had raised Lazarus from the dead that Judas had seen with his own eyes. Shortly after, it says, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was outnumbered among the twelve. He went away and discussed with the chief priests and temple police how he could hand him, Jesus, over to them. So he's going to go plot to give Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him silver. So he accepted the offer and started looking for a good opportunity to portray him to them when the crowd was not present. He is moved so profoundly by his vows that what he's going to do is he is going to sell out Jesus. He's going to take money to turn him in, to hand him over. The, the, God, the, God, the Savior who had called him to follow him, the Savior who he had known for three years, seen to amazing things, he is now going to sell out. All because of these wounds that had happened, these lies that had taken root, and this vow that had moved him forward. Because vows insulate us from the reality and they absolutely distort the truth. They make it easier for our mind to get around complex situations, vows do. They make it easier for us not to have to trust a God who sometimes we don't understand. We don't want God to take us into those roads, down those roads with questions. We want it always to make sense. But Jesus says this. He says, I am the truth. He doesn't say study these five things and that's the truth. He says, I am the truth. He's saying, grab onto me, hold on to me. The whole thing might be crumbling down, but know this, you can trust in me. But that's hard. Because that takes us trusting him, depending on him, saying no to maybe me being in control and yes to him being in control. We do that as the church. Maybe some of you today, this is your first time back in church for a long time because what you saw in the church was not what looked like Jesus. Because often in the church, we take certain things of Jesus and we amplify them. So there's one side over here that takes kind of the, um, the uh, authority and the accountability that Jesus invites us into. And we say, you have to bow down to that. If you do not, he wants nothing to do with you. It's the churches, they kind of, they hold the Bible up high. And let me be clear, we hold the Bible up high, but it's so high that it's almost like a weapon. And it'll hurt people with it and shame people with it and mock people with it. And it's like, if you don't look like us, you don't talk like us, you don't vote like us, you don't think like us, you're out. Authority and accountability. Two things that Jesus invites us into, but he doesn't beat us with. But then there's the other side. Affirmation and acceptance. And, and if this is the church that kind of smacks you around with the Bible, this is the church that says, we don't read the Bible. We're not interested in the Bible. We're interested in affirming and accepting whoever and whatever you think you are. Go and do it. Jesus isn't a Lord and Savior. He's a killer life coach. But all of those are born out of vows. Vows on this side that we, we, we have to have it all spelled out in black and white. We say it's a relationship, but it's actually not. It's things we do and boxes we check. And if we don't do those, then God's not interested in us. And over here, it's not authority and accountability. It's affirmation and acceptance. And I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. But Jesus invites us into something much better. Much more robust, much more healthy, much more beautiful. 
where he takes affirmation and acceptance and accountability and authority, and he says, I want it all. It's what he did with me 20 plus years ago when I started going to church. I said for three years, I didn't say anything. I, I would have said, I'm not a Christian. People would have said, why are you at this church? Because the girl who keeps inviting me is really cute. That's why I'm here. But he kept accepting me. He didn't affirm my sin. He didn't affirm my rebellion. But it's like he affirmed me as a human. I was telling my son this yesterday. I go, I was not a good dude. Like, I would literally go to church thinking about ways. So that girl that was cute, most of you know this, but I married her. But at the time, I was trying to come up with ways I could get her out of this thing. I'm just being real. Not proud, but that's what I was doing. But he kept saying, come closer. Know me. Do you know that when Jesus calls the disciples to follow him, he doesn't say, declare your allegiance to me or you can't follow me. He says, no, come on, let's go. But then he does ask them, who do you say I am? And then when they say, you are Lord and Savior, he's like, yes, and this is my role I got for you. Come on, let's go. Yes, here you go. Here's the gifts I have for you. Let's go. See, it's this amazing thing that is true relationship that is not a token word in their faith. He says, come on. He affirms the image of God in each one of us. He accepts us as our, and when we say yes to him, as sons and daughters of God, not a small thing. But then he says, go into the waters of baptism. You die to your old self and rise to a new way. Accountability and authority. And what those do is really call us into not the vows that we make, but the hint that he is our only vow. Paul, Apostle Paul says to, to live is Christ, his vow, Jesus. To die is gain eternal life with God. See, the cross saves you from reality and reveals the truth that any vow outside of Jesus just leads to destruction. But what is amazing in that is that there is still hope. I can grab onto the vows that I lived out some for 20, 30, almost 40 years of my life, and I can know hope because of what Jesus did on the cross. For me and for you and for our relationships, our connection to him and our connection to each other. The last thing I'll talk about with Judas is this. In John 13, and I just put that up there, so if you want to go dive into that later, go dive into that. That's what I'm talking out of. Okay, Judas has challenged Jesus about the perfume at this point. He's, he's, he's getting ready to betray him. Jesus knows this, the scripture says. And Jesus goes to Judas, and he does something that has always blown my mind. He washes his feet. He serves him communion, the Passover meal, and he washes Judas' feet. People will ask me sometimes, what does grace really look like? Like we talk about grace, is that just a feeling? I'm like, you want to know what it really looks like? Two things come to mind for me. It's Jesus hanging on a cross, for, for, like literally looking at the people who nailed him on the cross and saying, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. That's grace. And it's him washing Judas's feet. Now, Judas doesn't receive that grace. But the Bible says even when we are rejecting God, he's coming towards us with grace. See, vows, the saddest thing about this to me is that, that, that hole, that angst in Judas, that hole, that angst in me or maybe in you, that thing that, that, that causes us to grab tight to vows, like what it can be most satisfied with, the only thing that can ultimately satisfy it, with it is this connection with God. And vows rob us of authentic relationship with God. Judas couldn't see it. 
Judas could not see what was being offered to him in that moment. Vows rob you and me of authentic relationship with God and with each other. But the cross restores that. See, my life, I was taught to kind of hide my issues. I'm sure none of you were. I was taught to kind of take my weaknesses and keep them down, right? It's like the Michael Scott interview in the office. My weakness is I work too hard, right? Somehow I'll throw a spin on them. The cross is interesting because it says the opposite. You don't have to hide. I don't have to hide. You don't have to hide. Like, I, I can come to you and say, man, man, I think, I think you, you offended me this way. Can we talk about it? And you don't have to go, oh, no, and try to get defended. We can just go, okay, let's talk about it. And you can come to me. Because, guys, we do this long enough. I promise you, I'm going to let you down, right? And you can come to me and go, Kyle, when you did this or said this. And hopefully I go, yeah. And, if, man, if it's right, I just say, I'm sorry. And we reconnect because that's what the cross frees us to do. The cross allows us to be honest and open with each other. It's, it's ultimately like this marriage with God. And in a marriage, you're completely, you know, like you're completely revealed to your partner. And if it's a healthy marriage centered on God, they accept you in that. You're revealed in all your strength and weaknesses. And it's the same thing with God. The cross provides honest relationships. So what I don't want to do is leave you with a weight where you leave today going, well, I didn't know I had these like three vows before I walked in, but now I got them. Good luck with that, right? Hey, I hope you know, man, I, it is my job, it is my calling to be in this with you. Not just throw a weight on your shoulders and go, See you next Sunday. Like, if you ever want to talk, if you ever want to pray, if you ever want to just ask questions, even if you aren't a follower of Jesus, you just want to go, dude, something you said made me mad or something you said messed with me. Like, let's talk. If you're feeling a weight, let's talk. You can come tap me on the shoulder after or if you, if you want to do that, but you don't and you leave. My, it's really easy. My email is kyle, K-Y-L-E, at refugechurchov.com. Let's talk. But I don't want to leave you without just inviting you into some simple biblical understanding of what it would look like to take a step towards health in this. The word repent is used by Jesus almost more than any other word he uses. But often when preachers say the word repent, we, we think they're meaning to shame us or, or make us feel bad. And that's not what I'm inviting you into today. I'm inviting you into freedom. Like repentance, sin is walking down this way. But it's not just walking down that way alone. It's not just walking down that way by yourself. It's walking down that way with, with, with sin, with evil, with your flesh, with culture. And it takes something to turn and leave it. And the first thing the Bible talks about is confession. You confess that sin. You say, God, I, I have been doing this. Or God, I've been living this way. I've been believing this thing. Not so you're like, you know, feel so terrible about it and you're a terrible human. That's not it. It's to speak truth and identify it. The first thing you do, if you go to a doctor, if you go to a doctor and you're sick and the doctor just says to you, I don't see anything wrong. That's not a good doctor. And so God says, confess it. Speak it out. It's a powerful thing. But then what I'm going to say is cancel or reject. Whatever word works for you, reject that as sin, as something that is not what God would want from you. What the Bible says both in Ephesians and in the book of James is that sin takes a foothold when we step into it, meaning it's almost like we make an agreement with it we say yes to it, and now it's got its kind of talons in us. But here's the thing. They don't have to stay in us. 
What Ephesians also says is that when we say yes to Christ, I know this is a lot, but bear with me. This is what I'm talking about when I say, like, I know you can think on this. Is that when we say yes to Christ, we are the sons and daughters of God. We're elevated with him. And so we have power as his sons and daughters. And we can say no. And so often if I'm talking to God and he exposes a sin in me, I will name it. And now I will say, I reject it. Like, I walk away from it. I cancel it. I'm done with it. I've said yes to it in the past. I've brought it into my life, and now I do not want it anymore. Guys, this isn't like a, this isn't like a magic formula. These are just things that are pulled from Scripture and how we can live out this truth. And then we command it to leave. Like, if you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you can say, no more. I do not allow this anymore to take control and a hold of my life. And I want to commit all of this part of my life to Jesus. It's an invitation from God to not be passive in in this actual, literal spiritual war that happens. We don't sit back, but when we follow Jesus, we are called sons and daughters of his. And it says that we get authority and ability not to, not to make us rich, not to get us new cars like some pastors will tell you, but to actually live out a life where we proclaim Jesus as Lord And believe and trust in the power and authority that he gives us. What we realize in all of it, at least I realize in all of it, is that in order for us to be truly saved, it has to be him. That he is the only one that can take these vows that we make, that can heal these lies that we believe in, that can address these wounds that have been inflicted upon us. And he does it when he hangs on the cross and then rises from the grave. And that's why we'll party in four weeks. And that's why every week when we come to this table, we can come to God in a contemplative mindset. We can also come to God in a celebratory mindset and know that this body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. If this table says, I have a place for you, what this says to us every week is that our only vow is Jesus. That every week when when those wounds happen to us, that this is the truth that we want to sow into our lives. That no matter if we're hurt, sad, frustrated, angry, happy, excited, joyful. He is the only thing worth grabbing onto. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and thank you for um, the opportunity just to God, receive the invitation just to take a further step into trusting you. Father, I pray for those of us right now who maybe are seeing vows that they've made in their life that are outside of trusting you. I pray that they would know they can take a step and God, you are so trustworthy because you don't meet them with shame. You don't mock them. You don't reject them. You don't say we've dealt with this before and I'm tired of dealing with it again. You say take this bread, which is broken, my body broken for you. Drink this cup, which is my blood poured out for you. Sit at this table where there is always a place for you. God, would we know that that is where true hope lies and that everyone is invited. God, you are good. Thank you for all the folks who would join us today. I pray just especially for the visitors that are here that they would just know you in a beautiful and a good way. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.